All right, I, I think we can begin. I have one minute past 11. And uh, this is Grzegorz Kiaczyns from the University of Szczecin. And that's Mikołaj Kostyrko from Bamberg University of Malta. And uh, we'll be having the pleasure of chairing this session for you today. Um, yeah, we're happy to see so many faces here. And I think we can begin. And I have also, or we have also the pleasure to begin this session with the first paper. And we'll be discussing two case studies. And those two case studies will be uh, the excuse to talk about, um, uh, we'll be talking about two gaps that occur within the uh, interpretation process uh, while we are conducting our research with remote sensing data. And first, I'll be talking about the case study of First World War prisoners of war camp, which will be the, um, which will be a case study to introduce the idea of parallax, parallax effect. I'll be also talking about parallax gap, and then Gregor will be also talking, survivorship. talking about survivorship bias and nuclear warhead depots. So this first presentation is told as a kind of uh, small uh, provocation, intellectual provocation, to make us not only show how we research things, but also how we interpret the data and what we do within this data and how we use it for creation of our narration. So, Nikolai, right? Start. Yeah, thank you. Um, oh, sorry. Uh, just skip. All right, just to give you a small context of what I'll be talking about, I'll be talking about a specific case study of the First World War camp that is now based in Poland, that was built by the Germans during the First World War, and it was part of 108, 180 or so uh, prisoners of war camps built during the First World War. Nowadays in Poland we have around 30 of sites, 30 of those sites, uh, archaeological sites, not all of them exist till, till this day and are possible to, uh, to be researched with uh, remote sensing means. And few of them are still visible or uh, due to LiDAR data or, um, or um, aerial photography data, historical data, and so on. But only for a few of those sites we actually have uh, good historical plans, so this is where also the archaeology comes in to show us the, the how those spaces were built. Now, this is the this is the case study I'm talking about the the church, Christi Fountain and Lager Church, as it was called, and it's it's right here is the number 23, and it's in the southern Pomerania. Now, why have all right? What was our research question? Right, we were thinking we, our research question was how was the landscape built to perform the needs of, of the German soldiers who were, uh, who were um, keeping the prisoners here. So the question was, what kind of power relations were within this camp, right? And we were thinking uh, power relations, and this, this is also, of course, correlated with where one can move, where one can't go, and, well, to put it simply, the, um, the, the performative of landscape, right? So we started uh, with, with uh, mapping this site with, with the LiDAR de derivatives that we had with, with, um, with, um, with uh, historical area photographs. And we collected uh, a big number of uh, archaeological features, over 400 of them. And we made the feeling that we, we mapped what we were expecting, this, uh, the, 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 the plan of this camp, right? But it is hard, of course, not to notice that we are probably missing something. And we are missing something which we were actually hoping to achieve, to see how this landscape was lived. How they could have walked through it and where it could have, they could have not. How the power relations were connected to how the landscape was designed, right? And, um, well, of course, while we are investigating first First World War or archaeology of the recent past, we have a lot of different sources which we can refer to. We have our prior knowledge, we know that uh, how those places could have looked like. We have our expectations while we were conducting such researches. But then we have to also think how archaeology is constructed itself, right? And you could ask yourself if you'll be having this, um, this plan where you have lots of similar features put together and in a linear and in a nice way fitted, right? And if that would be an Iron Age site, 
what would be your answer if you had only this kind of uh, kind of data that you'd be working on, right? Would you tell that it was a hierarchical or a rather an egalitarian society, right? Of course, as I'm saying, we have lots of other types of data for historical archaeology which we, which we can use. And here is a, a methodological tool which I'd like to introduce, something which is called a, a parallax effect. Now, the parallax effect is something that all of us actually, and uh, most all the time, that we, we have, uh, that is implied upon us. And to put it shortly, you are introduced to the parallax effect if you look at your hand really close and you just close one of your eyes and then open the other one, that you see the, the, what is close to you from different dimensions, right? And by that, you form a two two and a half dimension. But where there is two and a half dimension, there's never th three dimensions, right? So there's always a parallax gap. And this is something which I'll be also discussing. And you can also see the effect here on the left. <coughs> but what, what is, this is also used in photogrammetry and uh, here on the on this uh, lower pictures, on the lower photos, you can see a house which is being shot from the airplane uh, from a different the different perspectives, right? Just like your eyes are focused in different positions and you're perceiving one point. Mm -hmm. And but what we experience in archaeology while we're while we are using different sources is also the time depth. So what I'm or what we are saying here is that while uh, combining different sources together in archaeology, we're constructing another dimension, right? This third or the, the, the and a half dimension, rather so, right? So within the photogrammetry, as we are used to it, there is always the time distance is really, it's really short, right? But in archaeology, we have to consider this time distance. And here we had the chance actually to apply further, further uh, uh, sources, like for example, uh, for example, the uh, the postcard, which gave us glimpses towards the intimate lives of the prisoners and how they interacted with. Uh, with the German soldiers who were who were keeping them, and we were able to construct construct the borders of different parts of the of the camp, and through that we form a little bit more towards our goal that we were we were hoping, right? The the intimate or rather the, the power relations within the camp, where one could go, where we one could And here we were also have, we we're also able to apply a fusion analysis and with. It's something that, uh, if you walk through the science cave, you also notice that it was the camp was put in a place which was a little bit deeper in the ground or in, in the valley, and and we've also corroborated this idea with the, through the viewshot analysis, and you could notice that someone would, would, who would be standing uh, in the middle of of the northern part of the camp would have the feeling that he's actually in a closed area, and someone would be walking walking uh, to the city would not see what was actually happening inside it. Right, so uh, what, I'm, what I'm saying is, and which I've already stressed as, um, as, a, as I think at least, is that within archaeological knowledge interpretation, we should also, we should first, we should notice what we are achieving, and here we are talking about this another dimension, but then this what we are not achieving. So what I'm talking here is this parallax gap. So when we have those different dimensions, we are never having the, the whole picture set. So this uh, analytical tool, which we're here proposing, is to focus on these parallax gaps that we should, uh, that we should also set the focus on. Thank you. So the next example will be, which was chosen by us to show that, or convince you, that it is always worth to uh, take inspiration from other sciences, not only what happens around uh, archaeology, but also from mathematics, statistics. It sounds kind of obvious because we are at CAA uh, conference anyway. And I will be referring to the term survivorship bias. The idea was known at least since the antiquity, so it's nothing new, but it was popularized within uh, modern science by works of Abraham Wald. Abraham Wald was Hungarian Jew who got his PhD at Vienna University 
and soon things started to go wrong, and there was a non shoot of Austria, so Jews could not anymore work at the university, so he decided that he needs to move to the United States with part of his family. And when he moved there, so war started, World War II, and uh, a few years later, the United States joined the war, so he decided that he also needs to participate in the war effort, but not with a rifle in his hand or, or as an airplane pilot, but with the weapon he knew how to handle the best mathematics and statistics. And I know it sounds surprising, but it's also very inspiring. So at the time, he was uh, before he was working uh, for the Center for Na Naval Analysis, so he was working for later on for U.S. Navy. Um, U.S. Navy analysts were making such documentation. Um, and uh, they were indicating all the bullet holes and damages uh, that were seen at the aeroplanes that, that were coming back from sorties, from combat, combat missions. And based on this documentation which was done, based on this data set, they were indicating a part of the crafts that should be reinforced and additionally armored to ensure lowest loss rate. So the first decision that US analysts were making just before Abraham Hall came to work with them was uh, very intuitive. They decided that they need to reinforce and arm uh, the parts that bear the largest number of damage. And it did not help because the low rate started to continue to grow. Uh, so they did not know how to explain <coughs> that thing. And then Abraham Wald started to work for US Navy and he asked one very simple but very important question. He asked, how do you think? Where are all the aeroplanes with the bullet holes in the engines and pilot cockpit? And the answer is, they are at the bottom of the ocean. So they were never included in this record. And therefore the decision that was made at the beginning was wrong. And he said, what you should do is actually opposite to what you already did. You should reinforce the parts that bear no damage because they are vital for the survival ship of the crew and coming back from the mission. And it was done in the, and it actually had to uh, lower the uh, loss rate. Um, so right now probably you think how it relates to archaeology and the way we think in general about data sets and about survivorship bias. Um, and I will try to refer, uh, show a very short case study uh, to present you uh, the idea how I use survivorship bias actually for the interpretation I do. So survivorship bias can be uh, explained as a situation when we draw conclusions from the set of data which is incomplete and we do not realize that it is in fact incomplete and we never even ask if the data set is incomplete, you know. So uh, conclusions may be wrong as well. Um, and uh, the case study will be the nuclear radius I am researching and later on I will have a full uh, presentation about it and right now I'll just refer to one of the examples. Um, so for example the uh, spatial plan of those bases was unknown due to some uh, circ historical circumstances so I collected a lot of data, remote sensing data, I'm on laser scanning the classified satellite imagery aerial photographs and I collected it and I recreated, reconstructed the spatial plan which allows us to interpret specific zones within the base. And for someone, for archaeologists who is focused at the facts, it may seem like my job was done here because I reconstructed what I expected. But uh, that would be exactly thinking in the terms of survivorship bias because there is much more to be told about this base than actually can be interpreted and seen within this image. So one day last year, it was July, I was walking through the forest uh, at the base for Bosco 2001, one of those nuclear, uh, tactical nuclear facilities, and I found the rubbish pit. And within this rubbish pit, there were some pieces of uniforms, things that I would expect at the rubbish pit within the uh, nuclear base, but also uh, some bottles, some cans, and child shoe and some women boots and some plastic toys. So I did not know how to explain that situation because we, when we usually uh, think about how uh, the base was organized and how was created the social microcosm within the base, we think that usually those bases were inhabited by young, very, very well-trained soldiers who um, dreamed every day, every night actually, they dreamed about going to war and finishing the world in a spectacular nuclear fight. That's our imagination, and at that time I thought the same. I think it was very naive of me, of me. and because I was thinking like that, I could not actually explain uh, the, some of the artifacts from this rubbish. But then later on, I met the guy, and this, uh, this guy's name is Mietek Zub right now, he's my friend. 
Um, his ex military, he, when he got retired, or like with tank commander, when he got retired, he came back to his family village, started to be interested in the history of the region and also in the history of the nuclear base at Podbosko. And he knows very well Russian, of course. Um, so he did one thing, probably archaeologists would not know. He re registered the two Russian social media, Odnoklasniki and Kontakti. Kontakti is something like uh, Facebook, but it's controlled by Russian government, and Kontakti is like for Poland, Nasha Klasa, or something like that. Anyway, and he started to look for soldiers who served at those bases and asking them for photographs. Soon, soon he found those soldiers, and of course, they never speak about restricted zone where the nuclear warheads were kept, because for them it's still uh, um, a secret they promised to keep. But anything else, just ask. And just between some of those photographs was this one. And it looked like those little chaps had a great childhood living in the middle of the forest with their families. And just behind them, there are houses of NCOs that I know from the classified satellite imagery. Those were houses of non-commissioned officers. So what I saw that those photographs completely changed the way I interpret remote sensing data I collected because I saw people of flesh and blood who had their little celebrations. Here is also the wall, a very symbolic, very meaningful way of separating the uh, area where actually officers lived from the area where they worked. Um, and I saw happy families and of course uh, when you look at those photographs, it does, uh, you, you are not anymore convinced that uh, the dream of those people was going was to go to war and finishing the, our civilization. Of course, I'm also convinced that if the orders were issued, they would do their job. But certainly it's not uh, about that. And I saw young soldiers who had their compulsory training and just behind them the garages that I know uh, from some area photographs, sometimes fun in photographs. Um, so what conclusions can be draw, drawn from this example? The first one, the first one, the first conclusion is that um, the way we interpret the data um, requires of us referring not only to one source, but thinking in the larger picture. The most difficult question that can be asked about scientists is not about what I see within the picture, because then all data set, because it's reason, uh, relatively easy to learn how to interpret the data and how to, for example, vectorize archaeological features. Short training and you do it. But uh, the most difficult question is to ask actually what I do not see in the image I created, what my data set lacks. And then the most difficult uh, thing is also find the answer for that. Because how can we answer for the question what my data set lacks if the answer is not within the data set? And then we, of course, have to start to think about the uh, methods we can fill in the gap. So that's the first thing, and I think. This is the most uh, important um, scientific and intellectual effort scientists can do. Um, and the other conclusion is uh, related to the answer why there were women and children within the nuclear bases. Um, so the, the, the social uh, microcosm was quite complicated when you think about that. And, and, and what was their purpose? And what was their meaning? Um, when you think about 160 young soldiers you put to the middle of the forest and tell them to look after a uh, weapon of mass destruction, sooner or later something will start to go wrong. Because they are alone in the middle of the forest, they are bored, so we'll start drinking or doing something, uh, morale will go down and uh, there will be some accidents. So uh, actually what uh, Russian commanders thought was uh, that the best way to control the situation is to create an illusion of everyday um, civilian life. And it can be achieved uh, by putting uh, officers and non-commissioned officers together with their family to this base. Because, believe it or not, nobody will control better the psychological state of, uh, psychological state of man than his wife, of course. <laughs> and that's what I wanted to say. And right now...